my PhD, I've moved on to do to work on a, a bigger research project. It's called Transforming Parkinson's Care in Africa. Um, so that's across seven different countries in Africa, doing lots of different research bits through, uh, you know, looking at novel diagnostic tools to capacity building to more lived experience, so understanding what it's like to live with Parkinson's in different African countries, um, looking at a trial of Makuna prurians and alternative medicine, loads of different things like that, uh, you know, pesticide exposure and um, analyzing uh, pesticides in soil and water. Um, but within that is a lot of this um, need for kind of awareness and advocacy as well in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, that's a big part of it. You know, Kevin, you were talking earlier about that bottom up and like understanding what people need and sharing those experiences. And for me, that's really important to actually hear it from people with, with Parkinson's. What are you going through? What do you need? What What's it like? Um, and their caregivers as well. Um, and one of the things that emerges time and time again is that issue of stigma. Um, so not just within the family, not just self-stigma, but in the communities as well. And that is across different levels. So from the community all the way through, through to healthcare professionals, policymakers, that awareness is just not there. Um, and so trying to understand what can you do? How do you improve that situation? Um, and a, a film is kind of not an easy way, but uh, one way that you can kind of showcase those voices. And um, so, you know, giving people a chance to tell their stories, um, you know, a platform to say, this is what my life is like. Um, and, you know, if anyone's listening, then do something about it type of thing. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was the media. I mean, the power of... Um, Film and media is just crazy, you know, that I can write a paper on stigma and publish it in a high impact journal, but it's great that it's there, but actually how is it getting out to, to people to, to raise that, um, that awareness? And um, so there's still loads more to be done, but I think this was a useful first step in saying, this is something, a resource that you can just send, like Kevin, you were saying, you know, whoever I send it to, um, and it's just easy, it's 14 minutes and it just tells you, about the real lives of, of people with Parkinson's elsewhere. There's also an, an issue that I, I've seen is that people care around the world, but then then their lives sort of, sort of move on. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't capture their attention, you know, right away and then have a call to action, mm -hmm. it, the things just sort of drift by. And things are forgotten in this fast moving world that we live in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's it's difficult to when your call to action is so big and so yeah. complicated and so difficult for individuals to solve. Um, it's really hard to then ask anything of people. And the easy thing to ask is to donate. And that's what we did. So we had the the GoFundMe linked to the the film website. Um, and all those medicines go to fund medication for people with Parkinson's in the community that we filmed, did the filming. Um, so that is a kind of an easy thing. But again, then I think people are like, oh, I've donated now. I've kind of done my bit and I can move on with my life. Um, and fair enough, you know, it's not your, it's not their responsibility to do anything. Um, and it's an amazing thing to be able to donate to, 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 you know, to fund medication. Um, but yeah, it's, oh, it's so hard. So if people can't donate, what would you suggest that they do? What would be the next sort of call to action that you would recommend for people? The easiest one, the, the, it's free, it's easy, is to just share, share the film. Um, just send it to, you know, five people, send it to your family, your friends, your colleagues, put it on your social media. It's such an easy thing to do. And you just never know who it gets to as well. Um, and how that can kind of snowball in, into something as well. Um, you absolutely don't have to donate. You know, that's if you're in a privileged position to be able to, that's amazing. But just sharing the film is just a huge help as well. Have you been keeping a, a tally of how many people you've sent it to, Kevin? Oh, geez, I've lost. <laughs> no, I've sent it to... Um, it started off with family and friends, and then it went to industry people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my interest in coming into this medication equity project, uh, when I was first approached, 
was I've been a lifelong executive in the in the pharmaceutical biotech industry. And I remember very early in my days when I was given an assignment, which was called, um, it was the entire world outside of North America, uh, and Europe, and, and parts of Asia. Uh, my, my role was to roll out a, prod, uh, a product for a company in, in the rest of the world. And when it came to some of the small, the, the countries that were less affluent, uh, here I was, this young kid, really eager to get my, our medications and do good in all these world markets. And I was told by a senior executive, Kevin, don't worry about all these other developing countries. If you club them all together, they're still not even with 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 the income that the, these countries have. You're wasting your time because it won't even equal one sort of medium-sized well-to-do country. Wow. And when I heard that, it just seemed like so, such hypocrisy. So the call to action for me to be part of this was to get, as a fellow Parkinson's patient living with it today, they were twofold. I wanted to get the issue of stigma out there because I felt stigma too, but I also wanted to see what we could do to try to move the ball a little bit with industry. Uh, and it's not easy. It's a huge, huge task. We, we have our task force meeting on the medication once a month. And I'm just daunted. It's so daunting how to start, right? It is overwhelming, uh, the different, the, the number of, factors that go into making a medication consistently available and affordable and accessible. Um, and it's not just, you know, from an individual perspective, it's like health system wide. It's like things that are just so out of the control of a small group of people. And um, we're talking about like supply chains and like you say, these big pharma investors and um, yeah. And how do you, it's just if perpetual as well, because we know that the awareness about it is limited and therefore there is stigma, but how do you get that something like Parkinson's on the map when you don't have the data on the burden and the awareness is so low? Um, and it's, it's, it's this constant like catch 22 of um, you can't improve the access to affordable medication without improving the awareness and then reducing the stigma. Um, Oh, it's just yeah it is it just seems impossible but baby steps I think um mm -hmm. and finding the right people and tackling one thing at a time maybe and, and you know, different organizations doing their part in what they can achieve and like you say can we now our medication equity group we keep going around in these circles talking about things that we as as little group can't even fathom achieving and it's just it's making sure that we're focusing on things we can do, um, whether, you know, that's making the film and sharing the film or whether it's contacting, you know, specific people in pharma um, or whether it's, you know, instigating the registration of a medicine in one country, uh, for example, um, because we know that that's a huge issue is that the medication is not actually registered in a lot of countries. Therefore, it's not consistently available. It can't be procured by governments and then available in medicine stores. So it's, it's just, yeah, it's huge. Um, and every time I talk about it, I think, oh, my God, where do we start? Um, but like I said, there's different people are working on it. So the World Health Organization is working on what they can do in terms of working with governments to facilitate procurement and, you know, supply chains. Um, so it's just sticking to what we're good at, I think, uh, as, as groups of people and in our, cap our capacity. Um, the questions or the issue that you brought up in Kenya, I've heard it in Uganda as well, uh, through other people's work. How widespread is it throughout the continent? Do you mean the registration issues? Um, the, the the registration issues and the stigma and the availability of the mm, just all of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the 
the awareness issues and the stigma, I think, for sure, is sub-Saharan Africa. So that's North Africa is a little bit different. It's um, it's got you know a lot more neurologists, like more um, well-developed health systems and health services. Um, but kind of sub-Saharan Africa, um, all the way through to South Africa, is the same kind of supernatural beliefs around um, you know, stigma and witchcraft and and those kind of thoughts about disease where you don't understand the, the, the kind of origins of it, different forms of it. And that's kind of why we're hoping to explore that more with, within the grant that I mentioned that I was um, involved with. So we can't just blanket a continent of whatever, 48, I can't remember, 50 countries um, with the same, um, the same issues. Uh, so yeah, we just need to find out more about what exactly it is and then target it. Um, in terms of the registration issues and things like that, it's pretty widespread as well across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, yeah, it's, just, it's it's a recurring theme, but I think we just we we like to kind of blanket the continent with this issues like all they all, all these countries have the same issues, which you say isn't it's not the case. You know, in South Africa, you can get free levodopa carbidopa as part of the health insurance scheme from the government hospitals vastly different to, to you know Kenya or Uganda where that is just not even thinkable um so each country has its problems and um it's it's yeah it's important that we look at the country and what their specific needs are um you know some countries have got uh, levodopa registered already um you know they might have other issues such as distribution to rural pharmacies or whatever it is um but i think the issue of the awareness and stigma is is widespread but it will vary um, as well, even within countries. So within Kenya, you know, you've got your different tribes and different religions and the coast of Kenya will have very, very different beliefs to, you know, up country in, in, uh, in Kenya. So yeah, a challenge. You know, I think it's really important, Devin, for our listeners to know that, you know, you register a drug in the U.S., you have one FDA registration, or and then you can... Uh, you, you, it's basically very, the, the task is very different. Uh, but in, in Africa, every country uh, and every formulation has to be registered differently mm -hmm. uh, and separately. So a registration that you have for Kenya wouldn't would for for one dose of a carbidopa, levodopa, uh, would not apply for another country. Uh, and that level of having an individual process that and push it through is 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 a significant uh, task. Absolutely. There's no centralization in all this. I would love to ask you some more specific questions about the film mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> because I know people really want to know about that. You mentioned... Um, playing to your strengths a little while ago, using what you have available to you. How did you land on doing a short documentary film? Is this something that you have training in or interest in in the past? Did, did the stars aligned and that's how it all came down? Pretty much. I'm now an award-winning producer. So, <laughs> um, Amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, obviously I've been in this space and I talked about the advocacy and awareness that I've been doing. And obviously my um, focus is on Africa and, and stigma in particular. Um, and David Plummer, who you see in the film, um, person with Parkinson's, he had been on a, a trip to Sri Lanka um, for work um, where he'd been the vi victim of, of quite severe scrutinization. Um, and stigma when he was there. Um, so, you know, almost held at, you know, held at gunpoint and arrested and kind of all of these things and basically came back to the UK and was sort of moved to do something. Um, mm -hmm. He thought, you know, I can come, I can leave, I can leave Sri Lanka and come back to the UK to the safety of, you know, England and be okay. And um, what about people who can't leave and who can't get out? Um, so he reached out to um, mutual contact uh, so Helen Matthews at Cure Parkinson's Helen knows that I do this work in um, in Africa and on stigma and so she put us in touch 
Um, and yeah, and so we, we got chatting about what we could do. He is obviously a, a wildlife photographer, so his world is film and, and photography and, uh, and media. I had actually just published a paper on stigma um, in February, uh, just before we'd met. So I sent him my paper and he said, oh my God, I think we need to do something. So we reached out to LSBT Global because um, uh, you know, I know that they're very big on kind of advocating for global awareness and and care for Parkinson's. Um, so they gave some of the funding for us to to do the the filming, to go out there. Um, my research grant f- funded my my bit. Um, and off we went for a week in Kenya to to do the filming. Um, not that I've ever done anything like it before. Um, I was kind of the, <laughs> the research kind of knowledge brains behind it. I facilitated the access to the people that we interviewed. So they were all members of the support group that I set up back in 2018. Mm. Um, so it was good to have that kind of group of, of people there willing to, to kind of be reached out to. Um, so yeah, so we all had our roles and we, we kind of <laughs> went in, did it and left um, in a week. Obviously, it was a lot longer to then edit and and kind of get the script uh, finished and things. But yeah, very, very interesting time and a learning curve for me, for sure. Have the people you've interviewed seen the video? Yeah, so we shared it through our support group and and, and sent it back. And um, yeah, I think one of them was like, why aren't you in it, Tash? Uh, <laughs> I felt um, the same thing when I watched it. <laughs> and behind the scenes um I think yeah it would they we picked a, a direction and that was that was it so I did the interviewing behind the camera and kind of the probing and asking the questions and, and things and um it sort of worked like that but yeah they were really happy about it um we did like you know like you said it was only 15 minutes long so we actually did do some filming at a support group meeting kind of after we did all the filming um because we we weren't sure yet whether we wanted to kind of end on that note of kind of you know this is this is bad and it's real and it's there is no kind of happy ending type of thing but our other kind of direction was actually look at the support group and look at the things that are going on and it is you know there are there is some good happening and so we did do the filming at the support group um which didn't make the film obviously um but but yeah they were really happy with it um and hopefully things change. That would be the the ultimate goal. But I think just being like, just being heard and being listened to and being able to kind of tell your story is so powerful, not just in the film, but even when you do research and qualitative research and you spend, you know, an hour, an hour and a half talking to someone and just saying like, tell, tell me about your life. You know, what troubles you? What, you know, how do you get your work done? How do you, what's your family like? It's just quite cathartic, I think, for someone to ask you that when no one's ever asked you it before. When you were actually in Kenya, what was the response from the community while you were there? Yeah, um, pretty positive. I think, like I said, people want to tell their stories and they want to be heard. And one of the questions I got asked on the BBC, which is a bit strange, is that did I feel responsible for like kind of the threat that I was putting them in? And I I was I was thinking no you know people they they're really keen to to talk to us you know they've never maybe never seen someone with parkinsons you know their their family members might have been members of the support group but that doesn't mean that they actually go and see other people so seeing david and the similar symptoms that they had in somebody else and the kind of potent, what could be so actually you know it, it is a real disease and it can be managed um with medication um they were super happy to talk to us as well as the fact that they know the issues that they're facing. So they know about the issues with the stigma. They know about the issues, the access to medicines. And so us wanting to do something to kind of change that is, you know, they welcome, welcomed it. Um, a few of the people we spoke to as well were people who'd, who I'd interviewed as part of my research five years ago. Um, so it was nice to kind of reconnect with them as well. And, um, and listen to their stories. And, you know, so one of the families, her husband had since died um, from Parkinson's. Um, so when I interviewed them, you know, he was there and alive and, mm-hmm. and well. And so during the COVID pandemic, he passed away. So it was interesting to kind of reflect on on their experience of that as well. 
Um, so yeah, you know, it's all about building relationships as well. So I think mm-hmm. I had those relationships built with the people in the community already in that trust as well as so it wasn't just some, someone coming in who doesn't know anything about where we were. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that helped a lot. Um, you know, I grew up in Mombasa where we did the filming, so it was kind of home for me. And like I said, I'd met some of the people before and Jared who runs the support group had reached out to them on behalf of us to, um, approach them to be in the film as well. So it's, yeah, it was all about that, that trust and those networks that we already had. Um, yeah, I, I think what would be really interesting is to do some filming in the future of the community and their perceptions rather than the kind of direct people affected by Parkinson's, but I, you know, that would be quite difficult and I don't know what it would add. Um, but yeah, to hear people's perceptions of what they thought about people with Parkinson's rather than hearing about what, people had been told about what they thought about Parkinson's. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, getting that different perspective from the community, I think would be fascinating as well. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin, go ahead. I know you, you, you were going to ask a question. I might have derailed you. Like, no, you know. the, the question is what next? What <laughs> do you do, right? Um, in terms of the research slide, we, like I said, I think we're, we're, we're on track. Um, to dig deeper into to the situation, not just in Kenya, but elsewhere as well. Um, in terms of the film, I don't know. Um, I'm still hoping that, for me, I think the registration of the medicines in the countries by the pharma companies, by the manufacturers is like a goal. Uh, it's just finding out how to do that or who to get in touch with um, and getting that kind of political will to do it. 